Thank you, Kumar. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Randy Roberts. I work for Chevron in the Gulf of Mexico business unit. I spent about 12 years of my career in our technology company uh, in Houston, uh, doing a lot of uh, CFD and simulations for different areas. And downstream, what we would typically refer to as like a refining plants or processing industries, similar, similar to what Professor Joshi showed, uh, in alternative energy and as well in upstream. Upstream is where we actually produce our oil and gas, where we have our offshore platforms and processing facilities. And that's a little bit what I'm going to talk to uh, uh, today. So I want to uh, thank Kumar and everyone here at LSU for the opportunity to present. Uh, I, I guess I also have to thank Kumar. My interest and uh, involvement in CFD and in this area it can partly be attributed to you because uh, you were my instructor for numerical methods some 20 years ago. So. Uh, wouldn't have had that uh, without his knowledge and imparting on me. So thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about uh, something very, a little bit more specific. So I'm not, unfortunately, not going to give a broad perspective of, of uh, industrial challenges and CFD. We'll talk a little bit more about that this afternoon. Um, but talk a little bit more specifically about one application in our upstream. And a lot of the issues and challenges that we see in this problem can really be extended to multiple applications within the energy industry as well as within many other industries. And that is complex and evolving multi-phase flow and pipelines. So really what our challenge is, is trying, can anyone hear me okay? I kind of feel like I'm starting a little bit. Is to provide a physics-based model over a wide range of scales in a multi-phase flow pipeline. So you see here we have uh, we have a lot of things going on here. We have you know, a reservoir where we're drilling for oil or gas. It's many thousands of feet below the water, many thousands of feet below the mud line where we actually go below the water. Uh, we bring that up to uh, trees and manifolds. We have tens of miles of pipeline. Some, some pipelines may be 100 miles long before we actually get to the processing facility where we're dealing with in those pipelines different evolving flow, whether they be uh, waves or slug flow. Um, and in those slugs, there's entrainment going on and drops and bubbles forming, uh, you know, drops. And the, if we want to analyze those drops even further, we may have actually get down to the surface level. So we could be talking about 14 different scales here, from the nano scale level all the way up to uh, uh, tens of thousands of meters. So a lot of different scales and a, a lot of uh, 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 different issues here from a flow perspective. So today I'm going to talk about flow, what flow assurance is. So I'm going to a little, actually even complicate this fluid flow even further um, flu by adding chemistry and, and providing what our real grand challenge is. So fluid flow, you know, flow assurance is the combined application of not only fluid flow but chemistry as well. And we're trying to predict that stable flow through a piping system. So from a fluid pro flow perspective, we have oil and um, you know, gas, water, sand, wax, a lot of different components. It could be laminar, turbulent, transient, steady state, etc. cetera. Uh, it involves a lot of the different rheology as well, dispersions and emulsions. On the chemistry side, as I mentioned, hydrates, waxes, acetines. I'll talk a little bit about that. The thermodynamics of that. And the kinetics, how does it grow? How does it, how does it form? How does it deposit along the, the pipeline? So the main, so first off, let's talk about fluid flow. So the main objective from our perspective um, is to determine the pressure and temperature along that pipeline. Very simplistic here, actually. So you'll see um, some of the modeling that we do is very um, uh, rudimentary. So we're just trying to figure out what that pressure and temperature is and how does that help us. So why is this model and why is this information important? So we need to try and size the line. So if our pipeline is too small, so we're, once again, we're talking about a pipeline that may be maybe tens of miles long. So if it's too, um, too small, we may have excessive uh, pressure drop. Uh, if it's too large, we actually may see um, some liquid holdup, some slugging. We may actually see solids or water accumulate in low-lying areas. So very important to size that. And as well, we actually bring on wells over a number of different uh, years. So we actually have to size for the maximum throughput through that pipeline and accommodate and try and figure out, well, if we do actually turn down, how is that going to impact some of these uh, situations? 
Uh, pressure drop, of course. Um, you know, we're trying to control the controlling factor is how far and how efficiently can we actually uh, pump and, and produce those fluids through our lines. So, you know, 10% air. Maybe that's that's a, a great air for pressure drop. Um, great over a small distance. But what about over tens of miles long? It really starts to accumulate, and now you start costs start to to ramp up. Uh, and it can actually uh, result in some some incorrect abandonment pressure. So we actually may not go after certain wells if we incorrectly predict that because there's not enough reserves economically to go after that, um, uh, those resources. And then actually from a, a more processing standpoint, from a separated performance and reliability and design, uh, can we better understand how that flow enters those facilities? Can we potentially condition that flow? So here's an example you see on the left, a conventional separator. And on the right is a piece of compact separation. It's a gas liquid cylindrical cyclone. It's a GLCC. And in front of it, you actually have a churn flow coalescer. This is just a multi-phase flow conditioning device to further promote the separation of fluids before it enters that compact separation. And there's other conditioning devices like that, um, uh, dual slug inlets, uh, et cetera. So why is it um, a model ac uh, accurate model necessary? Well, the eventual goal is to try and uh, uh, get some savings here. So we could be talking about tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, one example, um, we had uh, we had to, um, in one of the oil fields, we were able to save this amount of, amount of money by redirecting the pipeline because we better understood the actual conditions as it went up a certain incline. So knowing what type of flow and how we're able to transport solids up that incline is very important in the decision of um, which pipeline route they should chose. So once again, from a very crude perspective, a lot of the energy industry still currently uses 1D models. These 1D models are um, one of the traditional co codes called OLGA. Um, very good codes built up over many, many years of these empirical correlations, the understanding of flow regimes. Um, and a lot of experiments have went into that. And it is actually quite accurate for certain conditions. But when we start going into incline, so we're not talking about always horizontal flow or vertical flow. We may have 10 degree incline. We have some situations where there's 20 or 30 degree incline. So what happens to the flow then? Um, could have situations where you have multiple holdup solutions. So certain regimes actually uh, give you multiple uh, answers, which is a little, little bit troubling from these type of uh, equations. Multiple phases, um, different, uh, we'll talk a little about chemistry. It's very complex uh, when we're talking about uh, complications to this 1D flow. And especially, you know, the, the interfacial stress term is a real complicating thing, which I'll, I can talk about later. Uh, what the issues, so it lacks any of the velocity profiles. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a one dimensional, of course. You don't have that, that even a, a simple 2D um, profile. It assumes fully developed flow, flow through the pipe. Um, and it requires information of the flow pattern before you actually solve the equations. Is it in slug flow? Is it in bubbly flow? Where are we? And what if we're near a transition area? What do you do then? What's the complication then? So other issues, interfacial slippage, all, a lot of the closure relationships you typically see in 1D flow, very, um, very um, problematic. So how can we evolve from this 1D flow and bring us into the 21st century? So we can use CFD, can use computational fluid dynamics. Typically what's used is the RANS, RANS type of approaches, RANS equations, uh, can be fully three-dimensional. They're more accurate. But then again, problems still exist. I mentioned we're talking about tens of miles of pipeline here. Can you really do that um, very efficiently um, with uh, such a long length and such long length scales? We still have is issues with interfacial terms, especially for multi-phase flow and multi-phase turbulent flow. Um, computationally more expen expensive. And then deficiencies from a fluid flow perspective. How do you model slugs and these bubbles and drops in those multiple scales? It gets very difficult. So can we use even more, um, um, you know, better approaches similar to what I, I saw Professor Joshi showing from Kumar's example on the solid liquid 
So can you use DNS, direct numerical simulation, or large, large eddy simulations to provide a better understanding of that smaller scale? So you, you build up that smaller scale understanding, and then you scale that up to provide appropriate closure laws in your large eddy simulations or in your um, RANS equations. And you um, develop that. But there is still that issue. We have droplets that are a size of microns. You have bubbles that are you know, millimeters. Uh, you have pipe diameters of centimeters. Um, pipe diameters, long waves of meters. The, the, the pipe's kilometers. It's just a large scale uh, effort here. So here's just a summary of those fluid issues that I've already just described. A lot of scales, closure laws, turbulence, modeling, multiphase flows, etc. So that's just one complicating part. We talked about fluid flow. Now let's even add to the mix, and now we talk about fluid chemistry. So now I have a lot of different chemistry problems associated with these flows. So the main objective of produced fluids chemistry modeling is to understand the formation of those deposits, um, the changes to those fluid rheology along the pipeline. Um, and what we really want to do is prevent blockages in the pipeline. So a lot of the things you'll see here is we try to avoid even uh, some of these solids from forming. Um, but a better approach is if we better understood, if we understood how these formed and how they evolved through the pipeline, could you actually manage the flow of those? And that's much more of an efficient approach, but very dangerous when you're talking subsea thousands of thousands of feet under under the water uh, in a long pipeline. It's too sometimes too expensive. To, and, and too risky to take such an approach. So you see on the left there, scale deposit, on the right is a, is a hydrate plug. So to help prevent these blockages, we typically review all these different solids, whether they be hydrates, waxes, emulsions. We first start off with fluid characterization. So we want to sample. So sampling is very expensive. Uh, a well may be $100 million to drill, or even more. And we get one limited sample from that. So we, it's very um, important information. We try and uh, access as much out of that uh, piece of uh, uh, sample. And uh, you know, we do a lot of tests on it, PVT analysis, uh, geochemistry, water analysis, etc. Then we employ fluid models on that chemistry, whether it be black oil or um, some equation of state, comp compositional models. But we have many issues. As I mentioned, there's, you know, can have non-representative samples. We have limited samples as well. Um, unreliable lab tests. And then the equations of state. So what, ha what happens when we go down to higher pressures and temperatures where the equations of state maybe aren't as robust? Um, we're talking, you know, very, very deep now. And we keep going deeper and deeper as we try and find more oil around the world. So on the chemistry side, more solids here on hydrates. These are just ice-like solid crystals, these water cages around uh, molecules of, of hydrocarbon. We typically, um, you know, we do see blockages occur every now and then when hydrates form. They're very um, dangerous, very uh, dangerous to remove those hydrates in the operation. You have to be very careful in how, how, that, um, how you get rid of that hydrate. Um, so there's some safety issues there. And we don't understand how they, uh, those blockages actually form. How, you know, there's some mechanisms here, viscosification, um, hydrate deposition, et cetera, but we don't actually know how they form yet. So what do we do? We don't know how they form. Let's just stay out of that regime. Let's no, no, not go in that hydrate um, phase. So we try and stay to the right of, the, right of that curve. We don't want to try and operate in that hydrate re region. Well, can we change that philosophy? Can we move to, as I said, managing hydrates? So if you actually knew the kinetics of hydrate formation, how those hydrates agglomerate potentially, and how they evolve through the, the pipeline, could you actually manage the flow of those hydrates and move into that um, regime? Um, it's, it's very expensive to actually try and manage some of these hydrates. You can typically use a lot of chemical inhibitor, inhibitors, methanol, etc. And that, that also involves getting the methanol down to the location. So you have umbilicals injecting all those chemicals. Um, so could we manage, um, manage that? Similar with wax. So wax solidifies from the oil. You see a nice little picture here that's actually wax. It's 
coming out of the pipeline that's uh, gelled up. And you have a lot of increases in viscosity uh, due to um, the wax particles. That increases pressure drop once again. So we have wax deposition models. They're actually pretty good deposition models in laminar flow. But in turbulent flow, not so much. And then once again, how do those waxes deposit on the wall? And, and what's the behavior of the waxes through the, the pipeline? Uh, emulsions. Um, these are just complex mixtures of miscible fluids. It could be water and oil, oil and water. There's uh, multiple combinations of those emulsions. They're very stable, some of them, and very hard to separate. You could have asphaltine stabilized emulsions. Um, so that creates a difficulty downstream when we start to process some of these emulsions. Very high viscosities for some of the emulsions, especially near the transition point where you go from one emulsion to another. You flip from a water oil to an oil water, for example. And that also increases your pressure drops. Um, so the rheology is dependent on how they're actually formed as well. Other solids, asphaltines. So asphaltines can also deposit. Um, these are not seen maybe as much, at least for some of the industry, uh, than, than hydrates and some of the other solids, but still very um, problematic. And deposition models are, are still under development. Uh, chemistry, other solids, we could talk about scale as well. And then sand. Sand can often form, you know, we often produce sand when we produce oil and water and gas. Sand is just a byproduct that is also produced. So in the formation down in the subsurface in the well, a lot of times we try and prevent solids from, from actually entering the pipeline. Um, we actually put um, certain equipment down there to prevent it from coming uh, up in the pipeline. Well, could we manage, once again, just like hydrates, could we manage that solid flow? If you actually were to do that, you could pump more fluids, pump more oil, get more oil out of the ground, but now you have a lot of solids to deal with. And what happens to solids? Could you have erosion with solids? Could solids start cr um, creating corrosion problems in the pipeline? How do you separate those solids when they get to processing uh, facilities? So all these things you really need to know how much solids you're talking about, how they flow in the pipeline, et cetera. So some of our sand transportation models are still in development. So here's a summary of the, the chemistry issues, you know, better understanding of those solids deposition, that, that hydrate formation, and emulsion characteristics. And the interplay between multi-phase flow and chemistry here is, is the critical piece. So we can couple almost everything in single laminar phase flow, but when we talk about multi-phase, we talk about turbulent, it gets a little bit more complicated. And just, just for knowledge, you know, turbulent, we're talking the gas turbulent Reynolds number is in the millions. So when you talk about 2,000, you know, I know we're talking liquid difference from gas, but million, we've got to get to the millions here. So we're in many scales. Uh, yeah, yeah. Millions, millions, but not necessarily for DNS. So if we could get DNS up into those regions, that uh, it's still way off. So our grand challenge here is to provide that model, to develop a model that actually accurately predicts the combined effects of chemistry and fluid flow over multiple scales in, in, you know, in, a, in a pipeline or even other applications. So it must be physics-based mathematically tractable, so we want to get away from those correlation-based uh, approaches. Um, we need to verify with lab data, but also real data. It has to be uh, consistent with field observations and uh, high pressures and high temperatures. So it can't just be in, in, in lab environments as well. So it has to be that check um, that we need to, to do. And potentially fit with general flow simulators. So um, we in industry, you know, we may not be you know, wanting to use um, certain specialized codes in a Unix cluster, for example. Can they be uh, tractable and can they be um, extended into commercial type software that we could uh, utilize? So just some immediate concerns. We've already talked about these and uh, just some of the acknowledgments from the different pictures you've seen uh, throughout. So this actually was a presentation that was given about four years ago at a workshop that I'll talk a little bit about this afternoon. Uh, I don't believe many of these, cha these challenges have, have moved very much over the last four years. We um, tend to have a lot of glacial changes in the multi-phase flow. 
a lot maybe more in bio and nano, I see a lot of more involvement there, but in multiphase flow, combined with chemistry over multiple scales, um, certain applications very good, I think, in the downstream in certain reactors, et cetera, but in other areas, maybe not so much. So hopefully we are able to uh, push this uh, into a new direction as we go forward. So that's all I have on, on the topic. So thank you.